Speaking of which, I guess we may as well just start with Get Carter then. Based on Ted Lewis's novel Jack's Return Home, Get Carter from director Mike Hodges landed like a sledgehammer blow on the UK cinema scene of 1971. Not that gangster movies were anything new at the time, but up until that point, they had been largely cheeky, chappy and or slapstick affairs, played as much for laughs as for thrills. Hodge's vision for Get Carter seems to have been to redefine the genre for the post-flower power, diseased industrial landscape of a Britain in decline and push the boundaries of what was acceptable in the bleak, violent and sexually charged telling of the story of a London gangster returning home to Newcastle to investigate the death of his brother. It is safe to say he succeeded. Michael Caine is Jack Carter, the gangster in question, and his quest for answers as to the circumstances of his brother's death see him stalk the streets of a new castle in grim transition from vanishing point industrial tenement rows to brutalist concrete parking towers. You can have any colour you want in this movie, so long as it's grey, and let me tell you, that's as <laughs> upbeat as it's going to get. Amateur porn productions, slot machine empires and working men's clubs are the order of the day here. The clean lines of Jack's London fashion sense marking him out as an alien in his own hometown as he pieces together the faces and events that precipitated his brother's demise. Roping in locals as extras, Get Carter is a movie that is at once authentic yet fantastical. The dour faces of Newcastle's working class completely at odds with the flamboyance of its larger-than-life antagonists. The cast of characters can often be as camp as it is cruel, with the likes of Ian Hendry, a tragic figure of the British cinema scene, here sporting a completely inexplicable but awesome Scottish drawl, playing shifty chauffeur to playwright John Osborne <laughs> in his first big screen role as porno-producing kingpin Cyril Kinnear. As compelling as the supporting cast are, however, it's Kane who shocks the most, his Carter no longer carrying any trace of the man dubbed a Cockney Errol Flynn by the critics, as Jack works his way through Newcastle's criminal underworld, rekindling acquaintances and then snuffing them out when deemed necessary. Angry outbursts aside, the only clue we get that Carter may actually once have been a functioning human comes with a solitary moment's tearful recognition of his niece or is it his daughter, in one of Kinnear's porn films, whereupon suddenly the circumstances of his brother's murder come into focus. As a performance, it's a far cry from Charlie Croker, and British audiences were not prepared for Kane's willingness to play at such a sharp tangent to type. Only with hindsight did the movie come to be appreciated in fullness, and for me this was, and still remains, a formative cinematic experience. I don't know that Kane has ever been better, and I, in fact, I don't know that British gangster movies have ever been better. Come to think of it, I don't think British movies have ever been better, <laughs> period. So much of Get Carter informed the aesthetic of British cinema and the broader culture, both directly and indirectly, that throughout my many watches, I've never once been left wanting. From Roy Budd's iconic score to Wolfgang's... Uh, oh, God, I knew I was in for trouble here. Wolfgang Sashitsky's starkly efficient cinematography. <laughs> I find there are so many things to appreciate in Carter, and there's never really been a time when I find myself not in the mood to watch it. The dialogue, quoted in schoolyards up and down the country for decades now, is just the icing on the cake and there are lines which have practically joined common parlance. One can only wonder how many brawls must have started across the course of the last five decades with the words, <laughs> you're a big man, but you're in bad shape. <laughs> it's by no means a feel-good movie, but as a reminder that British cinema can be both entertaining and uncompromising, Get Carter is certainly to be celebrated. There can only be a handful of movies that feel as vital a half century after the fact as they did the year of their release, but Carter can claim its place in that pantheon quite assuredly, at least as far as I'm concerned. If being British means being miserable, then by God can we claim to be efficient at it, and here <laughs> is the glorious evidence of that. Yeah, I can't quite work out how this is not a black and white film, because it Basically a black and white film somehow shot in colour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, somewhere somewhere between that and sepia lies Get Carter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's strange that you mention Michael Caine having been described as the Cockney Errol Flynn because as far as I'm concerned, Michael Caine was, is and always will be Michael Caine. He, he's so very much Michael Caine mm. that he can't really be anybody else. Mm. Uh, it's a strange, strange analogy to make that one. I'm quoting uh, directly... I think the no, more no. in international press, yeah, it's, it is. I think to to appreciate, I know what you're saying. I think we we have a very individual impression of Michael Caine, and I don't think necessarily he's quite as iconic outside of Britain as he is here. But he's 
he's an institution for us, right? And this is this is one of the key reasons why that is, surely. Oh, I think so, yeah. I mean, I mean Alfie established him as a playboy and then the Epicus file came before this and they're, they're, I think both the other Len Dayton films were before Get Carter. So, I mean, certainly... I know Funeral in Berlin name. was, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, it's a, it's a completely different film from the Italian job, but this is the kind of... I don't know, the Ur Michael Caine almost. Hmm. I, I agree that it's his best role. And I think I mean, while Harry Brown is not a good film, like, had he not made this film, I don't think he would have made Harry Brown. It's like you would never have bought him in that role without having first established him in this. I'm not sure what my point is there. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I've, yeah. you've, uh, if nothing else, you've reminded me of Harry Brown, which I have still yet to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Please don't. It's not good. <laughs> Scott will attest to that. <laughs> It's a, one of those terrible Daily Mail-esque films like Cherry Tree Lane. Mm. It, it's not a good film. Don't watch it. No, I vaguely remember your view of it at the time because I think, was it not yourself that reviewed it on the old website, Drew? Maybe it's it was Scott. It's more like Scott, but yeah. I don't remember. But we both saw it and I think we were of a similar opinion. I think it was probably on our podcast, actually, rather than on the website. Mm. Yes. We both agreed no. Yes. No, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have little time for such Daily Mail type films uh, but yeah uh, I I can't remember not having watched Get Carter yeah. and and I don't I don't know when I first watched it but I um, would be fairly confident that it was probably because of you Craig oh, really? I mean, yeah well, all three of us have been friends for a very mm. long time so mm. there's certainly plenty of opportunity for that But and I can I associate this film with you more than anybody else oh wow uh, and like the oh, that almost brings a tear to my eye. That's like the best compliment I've had in the last forty-one years, Drew. And curiously, the quote you mentioned is the one I most specifically um, associate with you. It's just like you know, um, this for me. This is a full-time job, falling on with the bit that you quoted, and you know, Cliff Brumby that I can't ever think of in anybody other than Alf Roberts from <laughs> Coronation Street. Yeah. <laughs> International listeners may well be baffled at this point, but yes, Alf Roberts from Coronation Street. Oh, have you talk about international listeners being baffled to just wait till I, I'm talking about their next film? Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I might leave you two baffled if your memory isn't as good as mine. But uh, yeah, which I know it's not. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> He's not wrong. Uh, yeah, so I don't remember having really don't know, I remember not having watched Get a Cartoon. It's like you, Craig. It's one of those films I can always come back to. It's. It's not a particularly pleasant experience, but it's not one of those like hugely depressive mm. type of movie experiences either. Yeah, Michael Caine is just... I think the fact he's such an efficient hard man mm. that that one scene where he's crying is all the more effective for her, mm. yet it doesn't seem out of place. Mm. It's just a very, very rewarding film. It's just... It's like... One of the best British films of all time? Almost certainly, yes. I'm not sure about the... Again, I was very hesitant to say anything is the best of anything. Yeah. But it's up there. And honestly, I, you've said pretty much everything I would say about it, so I maybe we'll pass on to Scott now. Maybe it's something slightly more original to say than I've just spurted out there. Yes, boringly, I'm also just basically going to agree it's a hell of a film, a hell of a role for Michael Caine. As you say, probably never been better. The whole kind of cold deficiency of this character really should be entirely off-putting, yet somehow isn't. Uh, and it does make the kind of more emotional outputs, as you say, just a hell of a lot more impactful. Um, the score is incredible. Love it. I'd missed that for a long time. It was great to hear those little chords starting up again. It's like, yes, this... So it's like coming Doesn't it home. just feel like putting on like uh, your favourite pair of slippers or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've had so, so much, because it's been in quite a while since I've watched this, but like mm. the, mm-hmm. even the first few notes of that goes, oh, oh yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. This yeah. feels right. Yeah, 2020 is not so bad after all. <laughs> what I've always appreciated about this, uh, from what I was reading earlier, apparently it took a bit of stick with this at the time, is people were saying it was a, like a complicated or sort of difficult plot to follow. And it's not really, but it is something that you need to pay attention to. You need to remember who yeah. characters are in relation to each other. It's not particularly convoluted or difficult, but it does reward no. actually paying close attention to it. And yeah. I don't see how you could not pay close attention to this. It's, it's yes. a captivating film. Just uh, t- terrific stuff. It's yeah, puzzling that it was uh, not all that well received at the time. I suppose uh, you just don't know what you've got till it's gone. But yeah, um, certainly well lives up to the reputation it's gathered in the year since. 
I think you can understand, though, can't you, for audiences at the time that this was so far removed from what they'd experienced up to this point. And by yeah. today's standards, in a lot of respects, it's, it seems pretty tame, right? Because although it has moments of violence uh, in terms of how violence is depicted on screen now, it doesn't feel mm -hmm. particularly graphic, but I think it feels particularly real because of yeah. that. It's a single or maybe a couple of knife stabs at best. It's you know people aren't getting their heads blown off left, right, and center. You know it's not Gerard Butler uh, shooting infinite Koreans <laughs> on the White House lawn with like uh, perfect headshots every time. Uh, you know uh, at a rate of about thirty per minute. Um, it's it's really sort of efficient, um, but also. I uncompromising and sort of very realistic, which I don't know that that doesn't come from... Am I right in saying, am I confusing Mike Hodges with Mike Lee uh, Lee when I say that he came from a documentarian background? Am I right about that? Was it Mike Hodges, who the director of this, who had previously done... Was it Wicker's World or World in Action or something like that? He'd worked on... I, I should do probably do my research beforehand. I want to say that's the case, though, because, you know, the, the, this has such a sort of down-to-earth, realistic kind of grit about it that just screams... I don't think it's Mike Hodges. This was his first film. Um, mm. No, but I mean, oh, like, in terms of he'd worked in... Had he not worked in TV before? In uh, I don't think... That he'd worked in TV, but not on the thing you're saying, so I don't think so. All right, okay. I may be confusing him with someone else then. Uh, but it's got a very documentarian feel about it. And the fact that they've roped in locals to help just sort of amplifies the effect of it. I don't know. It's kind of timeless, apart from the invention of mobile phones and uh, sort of just omnipresent CCTV. There's nothing about this film that wouldn't translate to the modern day. It's just, it's really weird. I feel weird saying that this is something so bleak as this could be comfort food mm -hmm. but I don't know that there's another film, there might be a handful of other films that I would come back to as frequently as I do this film just for comfort but I don't know, there's certainly not another film there's not another film that I would more willingly come back to than Get Carter, if that makes sense and there's just something, I don't know and, and I wonder how it played for international audiences because this is one of those films where I don't know that you can separate as a Brit I don't know that I can separate myself from the Britishness of it. I think that there's just, it's really in the DNA of this film and I can't really explain it. I can't imagine how an international audience would view this. But I understand, is this not one of the films that Quentin Tarantino cited as the reason that he got into filmmaking? Or am I inventing that as well? Is this just going to be an episode where I pull stuff <laughs> out of my ass without, without being I able should to give know citation? that, having researched Tarantino for our, our last episode, but I, yeah. I don't recall. But I, Tarantino's got so many influences. I yeah. don't know any one particular thing. I can't imagine you pin down a single thing, but I'm sure this is film is, is one of the films that he's mentioned as being one of the principal reasons that he got into, got into film. And it's just so... It is just so British. And I think one of the things about it that appeals most to me is that it's a gangster film, but it's not about... Although the central character comes from London, it's not about London. Because as a British Which audience... Nice. Yeah, as a British audience, and again, this is something you won't appreciate necessarily internationally, but we are so used to everything being London-centric in this country. Everything of significance happens within the circumference of the M25. Yeah, that to have infuriating. Yeah, to have something as seismic as this come along and be focused on... You know, in quotation marks, the other part of the country, which is to say yes. up north. And although it's not in Scotland, I think probably, I don't know if I'm right in saying this, I speak only for myself, but I certainly feel an affinity for this because it's northern. and it It's southern, Craig. Well, You're all Scottish, so this is very much southern. Let's <laughs> let stop that London-centric <laughs> nonsense that somehow Yorkshire and Northumberland yeah. is the north when it's the, the north. south. Exactly, but you know what I'm saying. It's like we can. It feels like something that you can take ownership of and I just recognise the bleakness and the greyness of it and there's some sort of perverse comfort in that. Am I the only one that feels that? I, I get that. I mean, honestly, it's just it's the fact that it's not London is refreshing as much oh. as talking about British gangster films look at something like the Guy Ritchie stuff. They're so London. And it's nice for them not to be there. It's not about Land Rovers and Essex boys. 
That, that's very much the thing about British gangster films, though, isn't it? I mean, almost, well, not all of them, but most of them are capers. They've got the cheeky cockney yeah. chappies, and that's, I think that's, again, if I remember rightly why Michael Caine was keen to take this role, it's very much against that stereotype, yeah. and that's what yeah. makes it special. Up it's, until this point in British cinema, it's basically been plays on Robin Hood, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Essentially, gangsters weren't people you should be afraid of. They were, you know... They were a bit of a bit of a mad Cheeky lad. Chappies, that one. Love their mums. Do you know what I mean? Kind of as, long as, yeah. as long as you don't put your nose in their business, they're not going to hurt the ordinary man on the street. Um, yeah. And then along comes strange Jack... coming after like the area of the Cray twins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then along comes Jack Carter, like an atom bomb going off in the northeast uh, of England. <laughs> and um, and you know that's all she wrote. Uh, it's just uh, I can't think of another film this old, with the exception of obviously something like Lawrence of Arabia, which remains my favourite film of all time. But I actually feel. I can't believe that we didn't have Get Carter in the conversation, or at least that I didn't have it in the conversation, and I presume you guys probably feel broadly the same, but when we launched this new podcast with our favourite films episodes and stuff, it's one of those where I come back and at any time I watch it, I think, oh, God almighty, why didn't I, why didn't I <laughs> yeah. mention that? Yeah, well, to be honest, like, I struggled. Get Carter for me wouldn't have been in that conversation. Mm. I like it a lot, but clearly not as much as you, but I like mm. it a lot. But, um, but I, I had so much difficulty paring down any sort of list to get the f relatively few number of films for that. So let, let's just mm. not... Um, let's not even go there. Uh, <laughs> we litigate that particular conversation because that was so difficult to begin with. To touch on your point about like international listeners and the whole London thing, just a note for international listeners, the United Kingdom does not begin and end with London despite what most media and mm. most news stories would have you believe yeah. that there are other parts of it. Yeah, I was just going to say the whole uh, the whole sort of uh, low down, dirty uh, aspect of this film. Right, this is going to sound bizarre, but since I went back to when did we discuss this? The last time we recorded, we decided that we were going to talk about this film. Right, so it's probably yes. the first time I've watched it in three, four years for argument's sake, say. And we had that conversation that we were going to do this in this episode. And I've spent the last week, because I'm not Windows-based, because I'm uh, Mac-based, I've been looking for tools to do video conversion to... Remember, Drew, much as I evangelise Minidisc and I have a hole in my heart for Minidisc, I also have a hole I in my... I miss Minidisc. Minidisc was oh, great. Well, I've got a similar hole in my heart for Super Video CD, right? <laughs> and uh, this is... Super Video CD brought me my first viewing of uh, Kiki's delivery service. Didn't, I also miss Super Video CD. Didn't it just when I had done my own rip of that and turned up at your house with it on two separate CDs and we watched it on a... That's the one. Like yeah. a 14-inch portable CRT TV. And that's exactly where I'm going with Spot this. On. Yeah, I, I want to... I don't want to watch Get Carter on a on a 55-inch 4K TV... Um, and I know there's not a 4K, but at, at 1080p, upscaled, I want to watch Get Carter on SVCD on a, a on a CRT TV, preferably. <laughs> you a, want the viewing experience to be as grim as the film itself. I want the viewing, <laughs> and I spent the last week trying to get my head around the tools that I would need to go back because I used to do my own SVCD stuff because it's an aesthetic that I just love so much. I don't even own a CRT TV anymore, but I've got like a, in the garage, I've got one of those terrible little 720p um, uh, LCD flat screens with a built-in uh, DVD player. Mm -hmm. And I thought that'll do the job. If I can just get this down to SVCD resolution, I think that's the optimal way to watch Get Carter. <laughs> I really do. I honestly do. I don't think, I don't want this to be remastered because I think it would, this is one of the only films I can think of where remastering it would be doing it a disservice. I want to downgrade it because that's the aesthetic and that's the feel and that is what Jack Carter would want. And I want to say... <laughs> on a cold evening, wrapped in a blanket, in front of a 14-inch 4x3 CRT TV, watching this at 420p. That's what I want. To give aesthetic, do you also want an outhouse and a chamber pot instead of actual indoor plumbing? Um, if, that, if those are the accoutrements that would have to come with that viewing experience, then yes, there's no doubt about it. And the more I've thought about this film since I rewatched it earlier this week uh, for the podcast and just the affection for it. I don't know what it is about. I don't know if it's just because 2020 has been so bleak, but <laughs> like I do, I'm, I'm, I've had this conversation recently with someone else as well. I'm not afraid of death. I don't care about the prospect of death. The only thing that disappoints me about death or the prospect of death will be that I won't have another chance to watch this film, I think. Uh, when 
Uh, I'm afraid I forget which of the two of you said it now. I think it was you, Scott, in your introduction, but you were talking about each of these films kind of representing their decade. Mm -hmm. I thought, actually, yeah, not just representing their decade, Get Carter does feel like a very much 2020 film in a number of respects. (laughs) Uh, Well, as as does the other film we'll talk about as well, but yeah, absolutely. If you want to talk about just the bleakness of it and the hopelessness. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's... Just a, we're going back quite a bit now to when you spoke about this, Craig, but you mentioned about the, the weapons in it too. Mm. Um, I'm not talking about the impact now, so I'm back to just like yeah, bits about the film, actually. Like, so the fact that weapons aren't a big part of it, there's mm. one shootout, um, and then there's the shooting at the end, plus basically a weapon or guns used a couple of times just as a threat, but mm-hmm. nothing more than that. And I was like, um, it's like to leave me alone for a bit. Mm-hmm. I like that. Hundred you know, percent. If if you just got people shooting left and right, it gets really, really dull. And also, though, it doesn't actually affect Carter at all, because when that woman's driven off, when Geraldine Moffat's driven off the mm. the edge of the pier mm. um, in the boot of a car, he's basically completely passive, completely but, dispassionate. I love it. Mm. It's yeah, reprehensible, but, like, but I love it. The film does actually have wee hints of consequences to other people of his actions, which I like because yep. there's that there's one that one, and the one which I didn't actually remember, and maybe because it's, it's not seen in quite a while. But the, when Alf Roberts from Coronation Street <laughs> is thrown <laughs> off of the multi-story car park, he lands in the car mm-hmm. and it kills the driver, and there are two children in the back being taken away badly injured. I hadn't mm-hmm. really clocked that before. Yeah, but it's like yeah, so it's like he doesn't care. But like other people are suffering from his actions, which is kind of interesting that they actually had that in there, but mm-hmm. it didn't. They don't draw your attention to it, and they don't actually have the car to react to it. But it's there, which I quite appreciate. There's, it's interesting that you bring that part up, Drew, because this was the first time that I'd correlated that with something that happens afterwards, and I don't think it's necessarily intentional. I'd maybe be surprised if it was, but I drew, the, but I drew the correlation that that happens. And you're saying about the kids in the car and the consequence of that, and you know, later on the ferry ride, where he comes back into the the dock and the guys are waiting for him uh, to take him out. He there's a moment where he is on the ferry and he's watching. I think it's a, a, a mother and her two children, and he's kind of just like quietly observing. And I sort of wondered what. And it's the first time that I've actually drawn the correlation between that and the the thing having happened just previous, and essentially having just orphaned these two children. I've wondered why Mike Hodges felt the need to, or certainly whether he or Kane or a collaboration of the two felt the need to make a point of that in the ferry afterwards about him sitting observing these two kids on the ferry. And this is the first time I've watched the film and I've wondered, oh, is that because uh, he used Alf Roberts to kill (laughs) these two kids' dads? (laughs) And now the next day he's seeing these two kids and he's thinking, oh yeah, look at them, so happy with a parent. I've just deprived someone of that. But like anything else in this film, uh, he's so dispassionate about it that the Carter doesn't give anything away. He could be feeling remorse, we don't know. Um, he, doesn't he, that happen before that, though? Does it? Yeah, because he's still got that triumph sunbeam at that point and he's driving his Cortina later when he goes to kill Cliff Newby and Bumby, rather. Are you sure? Uh, I'm sure I'm, yeah, pretty sure. I think he's looking at that um, that family because he's just seen what's happened to the person that may be his daughter mm. and certainly as his niece um, I think it's that I'm pretty sure you've got your chrono- <laughs> chronology oh god maybe <laughs> Chron- I have weird way to- mm-hmm. I think you've got your chronology on there mm. but, um, but certainly yeah I'm aware of the bit you mean when he's looking at them and I think it's more to do with Dorbin it would make more sense if it was to do with because I don't yeah. think you see Carter see what happens to um, Cliff Bumby he takes some of the side but as far as I can recall God, have I got you that? don't see him looking at it have I got that arse over tit then I'm pretty certain you do because yeah. when he when he comes back when he drives up to the multi-story car park and the two architects are there and he says that's a madman he's back in the Ford Cortina yep. whereas he'd been driving the Triumph Sunbeam at that point that is doubly weird that's what was parked on the side of the the pier that is doubly weird that you've brought that up as a point then because that is that was like a formed (laughs) anyway anyway you've just freaked me out a bit now (laughs) maybe I've had my entropy reversed Um, I mean it's possible I'm wrong I no, you're probably not. I would not. listen. If I were a betting man, you made the comment about people's memories earlier, Drew. If I were a betting man, I'd bet on you in this one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just think it's absolutely remarkable how immediate and how 
I don't know, contemporary is not the word, but relevant this film still feels after a half century. I can't think what the other film is there. There are films there are films older than this that I still hold in great reverence, but I can't think of one that still resonates as much as this or deeply as this. I don't mean in the sense that it resonates deeply for me because I'm a London gangster who's returned to Newcastle to investigate the death <laughs> of my, my straight-edge brother. I mean, in terms of just there's something so essential about this film and immediate about this film, and it still feels like it... Again, like I say, ab- ab- apart from the invention of the, the mobile phone and the proliferation of CCTV, which would obviously rule out any of the activity in this film, this film feels like it could have been made yesterday. It's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. Yeah, in, in many respects, I agree. I think that the one thing that really stuck out to me is being some. It's not so much, you know, a lot of films now don't work because any tension of like not being able to communicate with somebody mm. isn't going to work unless you have some really weird fudge that a mobile phone is yeah. going to work and like lack of signals a bit dull yeah but no the bit that stood out to me actually is on the beach at the end where mm-hmm. they're just dumping crap in the sea yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that more than anything was the bit that stood out to me as being like just so out of time yeah. uh, for now <laughs> well, i don't know <laughs> What struck me when I was watching that scene these days was um, I vaguely remember watching the Get Carter remake with Sylvester Stallone. It was a bad idea at the time. It was a bad idea to even remember it. But yeah, just the concept of taking a film as bleak. I mean, nothing sums up Get Carter better than two people chasing each other over sewage-laden, polluted beaches with crawling over sewage pipes with <laughs> leading up to a coal dumping facility. Just just dropping it offshore. That pretty much is Get Carter in a nutshell. Taking that and moving it to last uh, LA, I think it was, and giving it, putting any sort of sunshine anywhere near the story of Get Carter is entirely wrong. Am I right? Because I, I, I have purposely avoided that movie <laughs> and you can imagine why. Yes. Uh, and I don't know why you subjected yourself to it, Scott. <laughs> but I know enough about it to say, am I correct in saying that Sylvester Stallone delivers the you're a big man but you're in bad shape line to Michael Caine in that remake I don't remember it that well because Um, I'm pretty sure that's the case, I'm sure I've read that and I don't even (laughs) I don't want to talk about it, let alone imagine it I can't (laughs) understand or fathom or even begin to uh, reconcile uh, my my feelings about why that is something that someone would have done or crucially why Caine would have wanted anything to do with that Yes, I imagine it was the uh, the but a truckload of money, and he wanted well, to buy a new house. Listen, the Jaws man, three excuse. Would that be? I know, but that more than anything, it still feels like I know to remake your own work. It's yeah. like oh, that more than anything, that feels like an act of sedition or something. Yeah, that's. I'm not sure Michael Caine should be forgiven for that, but <laughs> at the end of the day, he's Michael Caine. Yes, <laughs> he can't help it. From memory, Get Carter is one of the, another one of these films. If you'd called it literally anything else, it would probably have just been okay. But it's just the uh, the affront of putting that name on this uh, yep. <laughs> a bit of a, a reputation that it probably didn't deserve. But yes, but again, yes. it's the efficiency. Even yeah. the title's efficient. Yeah, even if it tells you everything you need to know. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's actually the, the title's so much better than the original work it's based on, which is a kind of yeah. naff title. Oh, it's the most anodyne title for something you yeah, can possibly nothing, imagine, isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah, it really is a nothing. And from what I understand, it's um, it's an interesting enough work of literature, and I didn't realise that that author, what was his name, Ted? Uh, Bundy. Ted Bundy, yeah, <laughs> Ted Lewis. From what I understand, actually, um, he was a, a fairly decent writer. And for some reason, I've I've not pursued. Perhaps as we're recording this, I will look to, <laughs> to torrent an EPUB of uh, <laughs> of uh, Jack's Return Home. But it's not a title that really sells it to me. Um, <laughs> kind of, I kind of want to, uh, I kind of want to investigate. But by all by all accounts, it's a, a fairly well regarded author and a fairly well regarded work of, of its genre. But I just think as a movie, this is just a weird... It's almost like a rite of passage. I, and one of those films that I really, really hope at least one of my kids grows up to be or to have like a, a, a pronounced interest in cinema because this is one of the short list of films that I would want to show them when, you know, of an age, obviously. Not yeah. now, at seven and four. I don't think they're quite ready for it yet. But it's one of those films that I really look forward to sort of... Um, introducing them to and I hope that it still feels relevant to them somehow although I'm not sure why I would wish that level of bleakness and despair (laughs) upon my own children oh I've given myself a bit to unpack there (laughs) Uh, 
I just uh, it doesn't really follow on from anything Taylor said. I was thinking about the legacy of this film and whether mm. it has any in terms of gangster films and stuff. Certainly, mm. potential a legacy in other gangster films. It's quite interesting that one of the actors in this is the mother of Sam and Dan Houser. Really? Really, yeah. Geraldine Moffat is Sam and Dan Houser's mother. Oh, is she the one who played um, the drunk? The, oh, God, what's her name? That first appears at Kinnear's house. Oh, what's her name? Yep, that's her, yeah. You are, you are shitting me. Nope, Sam and Dan Houser's mother. Isn't that <sighs> There's another woman with an... Under, uh, her accent's all over the place. It's it kind really of George at the start, but then it's mostly Scottish and, then and it's she's in, from Nottingham. Yeah, that's... But yeah, Glenda. Yeah, um, Glenda. Yes, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, Sam, Sam and Dan, Dan Houser's mum. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Like, because wow, we're of gangster stuff. That mm. is food for thought. That's amazing. That is genuinely. I want to read more about that now. Wow, that's just kind of like a weird. All of a sudden, that's bridged. Uh, well, let's say GTA. Let's call it 1997 or something. That's just like bridged like a 30 year gap somehow <laughs> and all of a sudden given this film sort of more immediacy that is super interesting she even has an uncredited voice role i think it's just a small one in um, gta 5 as mrs phillips i'm guessing trevor's mum i don't remember now <gasps> yeah actually mrs Miss phillips is trevor's mum isn't she so yeah she's um, the voice of trevor's mum in gta 5 no <laughs> yep <laughs> Oh my God, that makes me want to reinstall that now. <laughs> PlayStation <laughs> app, here we go. That's mental. I mean, it's got very little to do with what we're talking about, but there's something really sort of fundamentally just... That's like an inception moment. <laughs> and I don't know why it ought not to be, but that's just that's just some sort of crazy, amazing cultural, uh, cultural link to... Oh God, that feels like something's come full circle and I don't even understand what it is yet. Yeah, I mean... Those, the GTA games are obviously much more influenced by, I guess, like American gangster stuff and the Godfather yeah. type of things in particular. But still, the fact that their mother was in Get Carter, the, the seminal British gangster film, and then, yeah, that's, that's just made it quite interesting. 100%. Like, man. It feels like that, uh, that, honestly, this might be the greatest gift you've, I mean, other than the gift of friendship, Drew, this might be the greatest <laughs> single gift you've given me. This feels like you've just dropped that in casually at the end of a conversation before we move on to another film, but that feels like for some reason and there's been like a thing missing a, a missing <laughs> link between us and this film like for all we can appreciate it and it feels like there's something here i know it there's something more that i'm just not i'm just not rationalizing i'm not capable of comprehending and now you drop in that she's the she's one of the characters in this film is the mum of the housers <laughs> that's just mental and i don't even feel equipped to comment on why <laughs> Jeez, just on a just on an instinctual level, that feels like seismic. But right, yeah. I'll, sorry, carry on. I'm I'm literally just you guys talk amongst yourselves. I'm trying to. I'm going back through the PlayStation app here to reinstall GTA Five. 